Avasi, me hearties, shiver me timbers, and welcome back to the ultimate fashion history with me, fashion historian Amanda Halley. And this episode promises to be a lot of fun, and I want all hands on deck because we're going to be looking at what actual pirates wore during the golden age of piracy. And the golden age of piracy is said to date from the mid 17th century to the second or third decade of the 18th. So that's the era we'll be focusing on. And then we'll look at how they their fashion legacy has continued to resonate down the centuries. So basically, in this episode on the UFH, it's a pirate's life for me. I also thought it would be fun to address some myths surrounding pirates and see if they hold water. They certainly held rum, that's no myth. And so before we start, let's think about the instant pirate signifiers. I mean, when you hear the word pirate, what springs to mind? Well, I guess today a lot of people instantly think of Johnny Depp as Jack Sparrow in that seemingly endless Pirates of the Caribbean franchise. What else? Well, of course, the Jolly Roger, pirate galleons, treasure chests full of pieces of eight and doubloons, treasure maps where X marks the spot, parrots on shoulders, missing limbs, and an awful lot of rum. Well, although a lot of this was undoubtedly true of actual 17th and early 18th century pirates, this enduring image of the salty, peg-legged, parrot-wearing pirate is probably a product of a much later work of fiction. Of course, I'm talking about Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island, that classic of 1883. And its iconic antagonist, Long John Silver, did an awful lot to secure this particular image of pirates in the popular imagination. But although Long John Silver was a fictional character, he was an analgam of actual pirates of the 17th and early 18th century, people like Captain Kidd, Blackbeard, who actually set fire to his own beard when attacking a ship so that he'd appear more scary. That must have been quite terrifying. Calico Jack. He had quite the fashion flair and was named Calico Jack because of his love of calico shirts. But we'll talk more about pirates' favorite textiles in a bit. Who else? Lady pirates like Madame Cheng. She operated in the China Sea. Anne Bonny, who liked to cut people's noses off. And Mary Reed. And let's not forget Captain Morgan. How can we? We see his swashbuckling image every time we go into a liquor store. Well, I mentioned earlier that the Golden Age of Piracy dates from the middle of the 17th century to about the third decade of the 18th century, right? Why? Because this was the Golden Age of seafaring, the trade and travel that went with the ever-expanding British, Spanish and Netherlandish empires turning the oceans of the world into busy highways full of ships filled with the kind of precious cargo that was the stuff of life to pirates. Gold, doubloons, jewels, guns, gunpowder, textiles, and of course, the ships themselves. Some pirate captains were so successful that they managed to amass their own fleets. The first pirates weren't really pirates at all. They were called privateers and were hired by governments to attack and plunder enemy ships to wage economic terror. The most famous privateer of all dates back to the 16th century. Sir Francis Drake was commissioned by Queen Elizabeth I to attack and plunder Spanish galleons. And at the same time, and for a couple of centuries later, Muslim privateers hired by the Barbary states of North Africa or the Ottoman Empire were basically at war with European privateers, both groups known as Corsairs, and they centered their operations exclusively in the Mediterranean, with a booty on both sides going to their respective states. Privateers and Corsairs were sort of the hired heavies of governments during this era, so didn't operate in the same way as the independent maverick pirate beloved of Hollywood. Eventually, many of these privateers, corsairs, and Barbary pirates figured out that they could get a lot richer a lot faster if they raided ships and kept the booty for themselves. And the pirate, as we know and love him, or do we really, we'll discuss that later, was born. 
Yet not all pirates started life as privateers. Others were recruited from conventional navies, merchant navies, royal navies. Who became pirates? If they weren't a privateer or a corsair to begin with, what sort of reasons would prompt somebody into this precarious life of crime? Well, as we all know, a legitimate seafaring life wasn't much fun in this era. Boys as young as 10 were recruited into the Merchant Navy or the Royal Navy. And of course, we all know about press gangs who would literally kidnap people so that they would serve aboard a ship. And once there, the punishments were awful. The floggings, keel hauling, walking the gauntlet, all of that. And so when one of these legitimate ships was attacked by pirates, many regular sailors asked to join and the pirate captain would ask if anybody wanted to join, you know, come aboard me hearties. And many did. And who could blame them, for in spite of being generally pretty vile to outsiders, pirates evidently operated absolutely under their own code of conduct, which we'll talk about briefly in a second and which I found absolutely fascinating. Now, although Golden Age piracy was an international affair with pirates causing havoc from the China Sea to the Baltic and beyond, perhaps it's because of that particular movie franchise, but whenever I think of pirates, I immediately think of the Caribbean. And there are obvious reasons for this that go way beyond Johnny Depp's successful little movies. I mean, just a glimpse of this map of colonial trade routes in the 17th century explains it all. Goods traveling by sea from Asia to Europe, then Europe sending goods on to the Americas. Spain and Portugal in particular sending goods from Europe to feather their new South American colonies. And then gold and silver mined in South America would be sent back to Europe and from North America tobacco would be sent to Europe. There was this constant stream of vessels with valuable cargoes constantly going back and forth between Europe and the Americas. Valuable weapons, muskets and gunpowders were found aboard military vessels as well. And sadly, at the same time, we see the burgeoning slave triangle take root, right? And we'll talk about pirates and the slave trade in a second. But by looking at this map, you can see we're starting to get a bit of a cluster fudge right here in the Caribbean, where Spain had already established the oldest European colony in the Americas, Hispaniola, which today is divided between Haiti and the Dominican Republic. And so the Pirates of the Caribbean movies were not just set in the Caribbean so that Johnny Depp would have a pleasant filming location. This really was the heart of Golden Age piracy. And so with all those ships, all that cargo, and with pretty nice weather to boot, the Caribbean offered rich pickings for pirates. Also, as the Caribbean is made up of thousands of islands, 7,000 of them to be precise, both large and small, this offered pirates a lot of good hiding places for both themselves and their vessels. But during this era, this whole area that we now call the Caribbean or the Caribbean Islands or Caribbean, if you pronounce it that way, as I know many of you do. I think in England we say Caribbean, but I often say Caribbean because I've lived in North America for decades. Um, it wasn't known as the Caribbean. It was called the Spanish Main. So that movie franchise really should be called Pirates of the Spanish Main. And it was genuinely populated with pirates so many that they had their own capital city called Port Royal in Jamaica. This was a bustling little metropolis. It was founded by the Spanish as a base for privateers, but when privateers went rogue, they basically just took it over and it was famed for its gambling, debauchery and very questionable morals. It sounds a little bit like a 17th century Las Vegas, doesn't it? Anyway, Port Royal was destroyed by an earthquake in 1692, so what happened in Port Royal stayed in Port Royal. The original pirates of the Caribbean weren't called pirates at all. They were called buccaneers, named so because of the way that they cooked their food. Borrowing from the indigenous means of cooking meat in Brazil, they grilled their meat over a wooden grill that the French pirates named a boucan. Boucan, boucanier, buccaneer, cool, right? 
and highly related and also generating from the golden age of piracy, the Spanish in Hispaniola adapted a very similar technique for cooking meat. From the island's indigenous Arawakan tribe, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, they started to use what the Arawakans called a barbacoa, and voila, the barbecue was born. <laughs> right, before we look at clothing, and we will, I promise, let's bust, or perhaps not bust, some pirate myths. All pirate vessels flew the Jolly Roger. Well, yes and no, because each pirate ship or particular pirate fleet had its own flags. However, most were based upon a skeletal motif. Yet the skull and crossbones had already been used for centuries prior to the golden age of piracy as a symbol of mortality and was already so familiar that less imaginative pirates stuck with it. It was easy to duplicate and by God has it found its place in fashion history. So let's talk about the pirate code or pirate codex as it was known. You see, although pirates and buccaneers owed allegiance to no nation, they really did live by this code of conduct. Breaking it was punishable by death. And it is a very fascinating document. For example, in the Pirate Codex, it says that no women were ever to be raped. These were no Vikings we have here. All booty was to be shared equally and promotions were based on achievement. Also, pirates didn't discriminate racially quite as much as everybody else during this era. At the height of the golden age of piracy, an estimated 30% of all pirates were of West African descent, some rising to positions of great power, like Black Caesar, as he was known, a pirate captain. But let's not get too starry-eyed about pirates or imagine them to be particularly progressive. Yes, this 30% was most probably made up of West Africans freed from slave ships, but African pirates were still treated as second-class citizens by their white shipmates. And although many pirate captains did free West African slaves from slave ships, Others regarded slaves as a cargo, a cargo to be stolen and then sold and traded, and as a consequence, they profited as much from the slave trade as those who ran it. Yet Hollywood really hijacked the pirate, recasting him as a free spirit of rebellion and independence, sort of like the latter-day Robin Hood of the ocean, sailing the seven seas with a parrot on his shoulder, a wench on his knee, and a good time had by all. Well, they probably were a lot more fun to hang out with than, say, a 17th century clergyman, but they were violent, bloodthirsty, scary, and some of them seemed truly psychopathic. For example, there was one pirate captain who was famed for cutting the lips off his enemies, frying them up in a pan, and then feeding this poor person his own lips to eat for supper. So he'd have to eat his own lips without lips. Oh my God, this is the stuff of Hannibal Lecter, and I cannot believe I actually created an animated graphic to talk about this. Okay, enough of this nonsense. Let's take a look at how real pirates dressed. Okay, so the golden age of piracy is dated at the mid 1600s to the first couple of decades of the 1700s. So I'll make my basic pirate somewhere in the middle. Okay, take a look at this 17th century sailor's outfit, but let's give him a head. I don't like doing these graphics without a head. This was pretty typical garb for 17th century seamen. Take a look at how loose everything is. Look how loose his doublet is. Look how loose his breeches are. These are basically sailor's slops, right? Those loose fitting pants worn by sailors. And what are pirates at the end of the day? They're sailors, right? albeit rather naughty ones, but they had to do everything a regular sailor had to do. Climb rigging, haul sails, that kind of thing, and he needed clothing that afforded him that level of mobility. Yet the overall feel of pirate attire, although based in quite classic seafaring garb, was quite different to that of, say, a merchant seaman. 
and the first real difference is in terms of textiles. Unless a ship was plundered that carried existing clothes made of linen and wool, pirates would have their clothes made from plundered textiles, especially those of the East. The East India Company imported calico from India, and although a parliamentary decree was passed in 1700 to ban the import of calico, our pirate here is from the 1600s, and so let's give him a calico shirt. Calico was particularly popular with pirates, especially Calico Jack, who lived for the stuff, because the sumptuary laws passed in 1700 forbade it, so invading the deck of one of His Majesty's naval vessels, decked out in Calico, was certainly a finger to the establishment, right? Pirates evidently also wore a lot of silk, again, plundered from vessels from India and also pregnant with socio-political meaning to a pirate. Silk was extraordinarily expensive, it still is, isn't it? And an average sailor could never afford to wear it. So again, we see pirates using clothing as a means to show this breaking away from the sartorial mores of their times. That's why we've given our pirate here some lovely silk breeches. Of course, the pirate's sash is ubiquitous and probably worn for two reasons. The first actually being quite a practical one. A sash helped firm the abdomen and lower back, evidently, which made the endless hauling of ropes and sails a little easier on the body. But also, this again was a finger to the wealthy establishment back home, where only the ruling class wore sashes. And also, the more stuff a pirate had upon his person, the greater this spoke to his conquests, his success as a pirate. He'd have worn a thick leather belt, again to strengthen his abdomen, that quintessential headscarf to keep the sweat off his face. And because he is active in combat, he'd have worn a baldric to hold his cutlass and his pistols. Pirates loved jewellery, and because of the pirate code, all booty was shared equally. This means that even our lowly shipman here could show off his bling. Did he wear makeup? Mm, possibly. I haven't been able to find any accounts to say definitely that pirates did, but warrior groups have often worn war paint to appear more aggressive, and given that pirates were exposed to many different cultures, some of which certainly did wear makeup, there's nothing to suggest that they didn't. So his look was billowy, exotic and eclectic, and not too different from this etching of a pirate. Okay, this is Anne Bonny, a lady pirate, but all accounts say that she dressed in male attire, so I think it's safe to say we're on the right track here. Did pirates wear stripes? Well, yes, many did, just as legitimate sailors did at the time, and for the centuries later, because it was thought that if somebody fell overboard, striped garments would make them easier to spot. Now, let's take a look at a pirate captain. Well, because he didn't have to haul rigging or swab decks, his clothing would be more structured and fit a little tighter. And I've taken a basic upper-class suit from the very end of the 1600s or perhaps the beginning of the 1700s as our starting point. Jackets were the most prized possession of a pirate. And there was evidently a real trend for plundering jackets with the most adornment. A fancy jacket to a pirate was everything. And yet, even the most beautiful jackets would often be rubbed with tar. Why? To make them waterproof. This was a very common practice amongst all seafaring folk in this era. But I can't imagine a jacket this beautiful being rubbed with tar. Of course, he'd have worn a baldric for his cutlass and his pistols. Let's give him a cutlass there. And the fanciest hat he could steal. But although pirates operated outside of the law, they were still members of the world in which they lived, right? And a wealthy pirate captain could and did buy stuff as well. Not everything was stolen. He could order and pay for goods to be shipped to him in Port Royal, and so there's nothing to suggest that our pirate captain here didn't order and receive his hat from Paris. Again, he would want to show off his conquests far afield, so I've given him a lovely silk sash here, and of course he'd need his jewellery as well.
And so I think he's starting to look more like a pirate and not just like a stylish 17th century man. But not quite. Let's give him a hook for a hand. Does he look like a pirate now? Well, more like a pirate. But I think if we give him a pirate face, he's really starting to look like Captain Hook, isn't he? It's so funny. There is no mention that Never Neverland is in the 17th century, and yet every depiction of Captain Hook places him so firmly in the golden age of piracy, doesn't it, by way of his clothes. So if you look at my little amateurish recreation of a pirate captain here, I think Disney got it pretty right. And what about that wonderful movie trope, The Pirate Wench? Well, it'll come as no surprise that she didn't exactly dress like this. And perhaps more pirates would have stayed at home if she had. But of course, as we all know, unless she was an active pirate herself, and most assuredly would have worn menswear, she would have worn a typical 17th century dress like here. And again, let's put a head on her, and this time, let's make it my head as I rather fancy myself as a pirate, but would have been way too cowardly to go to sea. But I like the thought of living in Port Royal and drinking rum all day. Anyway, her clothing would have either been plundered from a vessel, or she would have made it herself or had it made. Again, she would probably have worn quite a bit of stolen jewellery given to her by her husband or her boyfriend as a means of showing off his success at piracy. There would probably have been exotic textiles used to accessorize, silk or calico shawls. Let's give her a period hat. And again, I think this is probably a pretty good representation of what women who partnered in piracy might have worn. But of course, some would have dressed in a far grander style. The wife of a pirate captain, for example, may have worn extremely sumptuous clothing. And we know for a fact that dresses such as this were carried aboard ship in the 17th century because do you remember a couple of years ago, a shipwreck was found dating from that era and it contained this dress. Dutch divers found it and retrieved it. The ship sank in the North Sea and here it is. And it's beautiful. Here is a close up. It is made of damask with this beautiful floral embroidery. It is sumptuous. And so the knowledge that gowns such as this were carried aboard ships in the 17th century, knowing how many ships were sailing around the Caribbean in this era, there is no doubt in my mind that many pirate wives wore gowns such as this, or even this. And you know what? I like myself better in this dress. Of course I would. So seeing how the real men and women, the true pirates of the Caribbean actually dressed, it's really quite amazing how wrong we get it when we go to pirate parties. But hey, that's okay, it's all in good fun. The golden age of piracy came to an end in the 1720s, early 1730s, for a number of reasons. One of them was the various peace treaties between nations. That meant less war vessels were on the oceans, which meant that pirates couldn't get their hands on the weapons that they needed, bullets and gunpowder. Also, the destruction of Port Royal sort of shook them. They needed some kind of central base. That had gone, and it all just sort of died off, but stayed alive in popular culture. The image of the pirate is an enduring one, and the idea of pirates being fun, I don't think people in the 17th century considered them to be much fun, undoubtedly was started with the Pirates of Penzance by Gilbert and Sullivan in 1879. But wherever we look, we can find pirates. Pirates can be sexy, like in this Jean Presler pinup from the 30s, or pirates can be cute, as in this 1960s greeting card. We've always invited these swashbucklers into our homes, as with this fabulous collection of deco homeware. And what about the Bossin wall plaques, a whole pirate fleet? 
And do you remember the Fighting Fury dolls from the 70s? All of them pirates. I think my brother Zach had quite a few Fighting a Fury dolls. And fashion has always been in love with pirates. Look at Scaparelli's pirate hats here from the 30s, but my favorite pirate fashion moment is undoubtedly from the early 80s pirate revival, which I bought into so hugely, so embarrassingly. I had sashes, I had headscarves, I had breeches. Basically, I wanted to be a member of Adam and the Ants, who really used this whole idea of the swashbuckling pirate and buccaneers in both their stage image and in their music. And here is lovely Annabella Lewin from the band Bow Wow Wow, dressed in Vivian Westwood's 1981 Pirate Collection, one of my favorite fashion collections of all time. And fashion's love of pirates continues. I think it always will. From Jean-Paul Gaultier here, and John Galliano, and there's Galliano himself in pirate attire. Vivian Westwood revisited pirates in 2017. Here is designer Iwa Iwala. Look, there's Balman doing pirates in 2011, and here's Libertine. Pirates no longer make people walk the gangplank, they make people walk the runway. But I think we all know what the very, very best fashion pirate-inspired collection of all time is, right? This one. If this episode has put you in a piracy frame of mind, I heartily recommend this documentary from the History Channel, True Caribbean Pirates. I got a lot of the information for this episode from this documentary. It's great fun and so interesting. I have to go and make some pieces of eight from my day job now. I have papers to grade, but I'll be back very soon with more on the ultimate fashion history. You can contact me through my website, amandahalley.com, or find us on Facebook. And don't forget to click that little circle to subscribe. As always, thanks for watching. Bye for now.